Part 1, the landing. Just the place for a snark, the bellman's ride, as he landed his crew in care, supporting each man on the top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. Just the place for a snark, I've said it twice, that alone should encourage the crew. Just the place for a snark, I've said it thrice, but I tell you three times it's true. The crew was complete. It included a boots, a maker of bonnets and hoods, a barrister brought to arrange their
such a carriage, such ease and such grace. Such solemnity too. One could see he was wise the moment one looked in his face. He had bought a large map representing the sea without the least vestige of land. And the crew were much pleased when they found it to be a map they could all understand. What's the good of Mercator's North Poles and Equator's tropics, zones and meridian lines, so that that man would come? And the crew would reply, They are the only the best of science. Other maps of such shapes with their islands and caves, but we got our brave captain to them, so the crew would contest that he's bought with the best, a perfect and absolute blank. This was trouble, no doubt, but they probably found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion of crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his belt. <laughs> he was thoughtful and brave, but the orders he gave were enough to bewilder the crew. When he cried, steer to starboard, but keep her head larboard, what on earth was the hell's man to do? Then the last bit got mixed with the brother sometimes. I think as a well man remarked. That the thing can happen in tropical climate when a vessel is, so to speak, snocked.
baker's tail. They roused him with mutton. They roused him with ice. They roused him with mustard and cress. They roused him with chow and judicious advice. They sent him conundrums to guess. When at length he sat up and was able to speak, his sad story he offered to tell. And the bellman cried, Silence! Not even the shriek! And excitedly tingled his bell. There was silence supreme, not a shriek, not a scream, scarcely even a howl or a groan. As the man they called home told his story of the world in an antediluvian tone. My father and mother were honest, therefore. Skip all that! cried the bellman in place. If it once becomes dark, then there's no chance of a snark. We have hardly a minute to waste. I see forty years of the baker in his years, and proceed to write further remark. The day we took the reward of the ship to help you in hunting this man. A dear uncle of mine, after whom I was named, remarked that I raised him the bell. Oh, skip your dear uncle, the bellman exclaimed, as he had the anger and tingled his bell. You remarked to me then, said the mildest of men. If your snark be a snark, that is right. Fetch it home, by all means. You may serve it with greens, and as handy for striking light. You may seek it with thimbles, and seek it with care. You may hunt it with forks and hope. You may threaten its life with a railway share. You may charm it with smiles and so. That's exactly the method of the bellman bow in hasty parenthesis cried. That's exactly the way I have always been told that the capture of snarks should be tried. But oh, be niche nephew, beware of the day. If your snark be a boojo, for then you will softly and suddenly vanish away and never be met with again. It is this, it is this that impresses my soul when I think of my uncle's last words. And my heart is like nothing so much as a bowl, brimming over with quivering curves. It is this, it is this. We have had that before, the bellman indignantly said. And the baker replied, let me say it once more. It is this, it is this that I dread. And we engage with the star every night after dark in a dreamy, delirious fight. I serve it with greens in those shadowy scenes, and I use it for striking a light. But if ever I meet with a boojo, that day, in the moment, in this I am sure, I shall softly and suddenly vanish away. And this notion I cannot endure. <laughs> If all we had spoken before, it's excessively awkward to mention uh, with the snark, so to speak, at the door. We should always grieve if you well may grieve, if you never were met with again. But surely, my man, when the voyage began, you might have suggested that it's excessively awkward to mention now, uh, as I think I've already remarked. The man they called Kai replied with a sigh, I am caught to the day we embarked. You may charge me for murder or want of sense. We are all asleep at times, but the slightest approach to a false pretense was never among my crimes. I said it in Hebrew, I said it in Dutch, I said it in German and Greek, but I wholly forgot, and in fact, that English It is a pitiful tale, said the bellman, whose face had grown longer in every word. But now that you have stated the whole of your case, more debate would be simply absurd. The rest of my speech, exclaimed his men, you shall hear when I have leisure to speak it. But the snark is at hand. Let me tell you again, it is your glorious duty to seek it. To seek it with thimbles, to seek it with care, to pursue it with forks and hope. Threaten its life with a railway share, to charm it with smiles, and so, 
For the stars are a peculiar creature that won't be caught in the conscious way. Do all that you know and try all that you don't. The chance must be wasted today. For what? England expects. I forbear to proceed. Tis a maximum tremendous but trite. And you best be unpacking the things that you need to rig yourselves out for the fight. Then the banker endorsed a blank check to keep off and changed his little silver for notes. The baker was a pair, combed his whiskers and hair, and shook the dust out of his coat. The boots and the roper were sharpening his face, each working the grindstone in turn. But the beaver went on making faces and displayed no interest in the concern. Then the barrister tried to appeal to his pride and vainly seemed to cite a number of cases in which made the maces had put the infringement of right. The maker of bonnets ferociously planned a novel arrangement of both, while the failure maker with quivering hands was talking the tip of his nose. The butcher turned nervous and dragged himself fine with yellow kid gloves and a rough. He said it felt exactly like going to die. Which the bellman declared the whole stuff. Introduce me now, there's the fellow that said, if we happen to meet it together. And the bellman, sagaciously nodding his head, said, that must depend on the weather. The beaver went simply balancing about, and seeing the butcher so shy, and even the baker, though stupid and stout, made an effort to wink it with one eye. The young man said the bellman, in love, and we heard the butcher beginning to sob. Should we meet with a juju, that desperate word, we should need all our strength for the job. David Kitt and Margie G. Lewis.
till merely from nervousness, not from goodwill, they marched along shoulder to shoulder. Then a scream, shrill and high, rent the shuddering sky, and they knew that some danger was near. The beaver turned pale to the tip of its tail, and even the butcher felt queer. He thought of his childhood left far, far behind, that little and innocent state. The sound so exactly recalled to his mind a pencil that squeaks on a slate. Is the voice of the Jojo who suddenly cried, this man that they used to call Gums. As the bellman would tell you, he added with pride, I wrote that sentiment once. Tis the note of the Jojo who can die in truth. You will find I have told, told it to you twice. Tis the song of the Jojo, the proof is complete. If only I have stated it twice. <coughs> The people had counted with scrupulous care, attending to every word. But in fairly lost heart and outgrowing of despair, when the third reputation occurred. It felt that in spite of all possible pains, he had somehow contrived to his hand. And the only thing now was to rack its for brains by reckoning up the amount. To add it to one that could be but done its head with fingers and thumbs. Counting with tears, in earlier years, it had taken no end to the chance. The thing can be done, said the butcher, I think. The thing must be done, I'm sure. The thing shall be done. Bring me paper and ink. The best there is time to procure. The beaver brought paper, portfolio of pens, and ink in unfailing supplies. While strange, creepy creatures came out of their dens and watched them with wondering eyes. So engrossed was the butcher, he heeded them not, as he wrote with a pen in each hand, and explained all the while in a popular style, which the beaver could well understand. Taking three as a subject to reason about, a convenient number to state, we add seven and ten, and then multiply out by one thousand diminished by eight. The result we proceed to divide, as you see, by nine hundred and ninety and two. Then subtract seventeen, and the answer must be exactly and perfectly true. The method employed I would gladly explain, while well, I have it so clear in my head. If I had but the time, and you had but the brain, but not yet the maze to be In one more I see what was hidden to be enveloped in absolute mystery, and with every extra charge I have given you at large a lesson in natural history. In this general way, we proceed to say, forgetting our laws of propriety, and that given instruction without introduction would have caused quite a thrill in society. As to temper the jungles at desperate board, since it is a perpetual passion. Its taste in costume is entirely absurd. It is age ahead of the fashion. <laughs> but it brings any friend it has met once before. It will never look at her arm. And in charity meetings, it stands at the door and collects, though it does not subscribe. Its flavor when cooked is more exquisite far than mutton or oysters or eggs. Some people think it keeps best in an ivory. And some in a holding case. You boil it in sawdust, you salt it in blue. You consider you condense it with locus and tape, still keeping one principal object in view to preserve its symmetrical. The butcher would gladly have talked to the next day, but he felt that the lesson must end, and he went with delight. In attempting to say, he considered the beaver his friend. While the beaver confessed with affectionate looks, more eloquent even than tears, it had learned in ten minutes far more than all books would have taught it in seventy years. They returned, hand in hand, the bellman, unmanned, for a moment with noble emotion, said, 
that simply repays all the wearisome days we have spent on the bitterly ocean. Would it ever be known? In winter or summer, it was always the same. You could never meet either alone. And when quarrels arose, as one frequently finds, quarrels will, spite of every endeavor, the song of the Jojo recurred to their minds and cemented their friendship forever.
John said before, I'm continuing to study. For the barrister, so a little bit of as the lawyer to whom the defence is entrusted, but barely known to the law. Thus the barrister dreamed, while the bellowing seemed to grow every moment more clear, till he woke to the knell of a furious bell which the bellman rang close at his ear. Part 7. The Banker's Fate. They sought it with thimbles, they sought it with care, they pursued it with forks and hope. They threatened its life with a railway share, they charmed it with smiles and soap. And the banker, inspired with a courage so new, it was matter for general remark, must rushed madly ahead and was lost to their view in a zeal to discover the snark. But while he was seeking with thimbles and care, the banker snatched swiftly drew nigh, and grabbed at the banker and shrieked in despair, for he knew it was useless to fly. He offered a darn discount, he offered a check. Strong bearer for seven pounds ten, but the banner snatch nearly extended its length and grabbed at the banner again. Without a rest or pause, while those fruinous jaws went savagely snapping around, he skipped at the knot, floundered and plot, and fainted at the ground. The banner snatch fled as the others appeared, led on by the fierce kick of the other, and the bellman remarked, It is just as I feared, and solemnly told them to death. He was black in the face. And they scarcely could trace the least likeness to what he had been. But so great was his fright that his waistcoat turned white, a wonderful thing to be seen. To the horror of all who were present that day, he uprose in full evening dress, and with senseless grimaces endeavoured to say what his tongue could no longer express. Danny sank in a chair ran his hands through his hair and chanted in mincey's tones, words whose utter inanity proved his insanity while he rattled a couple of bones. <coughs> Leave him here to his fate, it is getting so late, the bellman exclaimed in fright, we have lost half the day, any further delay, and we shan't have to start. Part 8. The Vanishing. Where the baker had met with the snark. 
in the midst of the word he was trying to say, in the midst of his laughter and glee, he had softly and suddenly vanished away. For the snark was a good job, you see. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 